I wish you all had the benefit of uh, seeing the kids leave the room like I have from up here. It's so neat to watch, uh, you know, kids from that tall to that tall get up and go off to their own worship service together. It's a beautiful, beautiful sight. I'm so thankful for all that God um, is doing and has already done and will do in these days to come in the lives of our young people. I believe wholeheartedly that if Waynedale Baptist Church is going to be the church that God called us to be, we have to take our ministry to young people seriously. And so I'm thankful for all of our teachers that work in that area, uh, for all the helpers, for all the people that pray for our kids, uh, everyone that has done work in uh, renovating the lower level. I'm so thankful for you. You would probably be amazed at the number of times uh, that I mention you before the Father. So thankful for all that God is doing there. Praise the Lord. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 4. If you're not already there, I encourage you to turn over there. We're going to read a passage on the screen in just a moment, but I want to kind of set the stage. But even before we do that, I want to say good morning to those that are joining us by way of Facebook. Uh, so glad to have you here with us, if only through cyberspace. I pray that through uh, the service that you watch here at Waynedale Baptist Church this morning, that you would be inclined to come and join us in person. It's really true that there's nothing like being here. I mean, watching it online is one thing, but being here is something altogether different. So our hope is, is that uh, maybe if you're sick this morning and you're watching from home or you're checking us out to see if we're crazy or not, uh, either way, that you would try joining us next Sunday. So in John chapter 4, we see a story play out uh, that, that is a fascinating story, one of my favorite of all the stories in the New Testament, and you'll see some truths from last week's sermon that will overlap into this week's sermon. Uh, last week, we looked at a, a fascinating story about Jesus' encounter in the middle of the night with a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, and there was one particular uh, sentence that Jesus uttered to Nicodemus. It was incredibly powerful. Uh, Nicodemus was a religious man. He knew a lot of things, but he didn't know Jesus. And I just want to say to you, you can know a lot of things, and they might be good in trivial pursuit, but they're not going to get you anywhere with the Lord unless you know him personally. So it's one thing to be religious. It's another thing altogether to know Jesus. So some of the truths that we saw last week, they're going to carry over and overlap into this week's message. And I think that God has a plan. Her, but a divine appointment with a woman who is unnamed. The Bible simply refers to her as a Samaritan woman. Jesus had been down in the southern part of the country, and he wanted to go up to Galilee. And in order to get there, the shortest route was to go up through a territory known as Samaria. Many of you have heard of that. But in those days, there was a, 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 an ethnic division between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were people that all the way back, if you go all the way back to the Old Testament days, 500 years earlier, when the Assyrians invaded the area around Jerusalem, they carried all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas off to Babylon, and then sent Assyrian people in to habitate that area. For 500 years, the Assyrian people have inhabited the area around Jerusalem, and they began to uh, marry and, and, and cohabitate with the Jewish people. Assyrian sons and daughters were marrying Jewish sons and daughters. And they became sort of, a, if you will pardon the, the expression, a kind of a, 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 a whole generation of crossbreeds, if you will. And so in Jesus' day, a strong Jew had a disdain for Samaritan people. They were half-breeds. And so the, the average Jew, if he was down in the southern part of the country and he wanted to go up to Galilee, he would go around Samaria just so he didn't risk being tainted by the half-breed Samaritans, okay? But Jesus, being different in so many ways, he does not go around Samaria. Jesus goes right through the middle of Samaria, and he meets in a little town by the name of Sychar, this woman that we'll meet this morning. 
500 years of crossbreeding, not only physically, but religiously. The people of Assyria had brought all of their false religion down into the area around Jerusalem. So the, the woman that Jesus encounters, not only is, not only is she, a, a, again, pardon the expression, a crossbreed physically, but she also has a, a religious concoction. Some of the Jehovah God of the Bible and some of the Baals of the Old Testament all kind of mingled together. This morning, as we look at the encounter between Jesus and this woman, some powerful truths will come out. I want to ask you to stand out of reverence for the reading of God's Word as we turn there to John chapter 4. Our official text for this morning begins at verse 7, but we're going, to, we're going to go back to the beginning of the chapter, and I'll read there, and then you all join in with me when we get to verse 7. Here's what God's Word says. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, so, Je so Jesus being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you go? Where do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this amazing story. Lord, I pray that it would be more than just words on a page this morning. But Lord, it would spring up into the waters of life in our heart. Jesus, come and be with us now. If any of us thirst, Lord, give us water. 
that will make us never to thirst again. Lord, give us something that quenches more than the physical thirst, but the thirst of our soul. Father, I pray that this morning as we look at this story here in John chapter 4, that you would help us to step into the Bible. Lord, that we would realize that in many ways we're not all that much different than this woman of Samaria. Lord, help us to have an encounter with you this morning. Strong and powerful, life-changing, living water. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for honoring God with the reading of His Word. It's a powerful story. I love this story in so many ways, as I already mentioned. As you look at the story, it's not hard to see the connections between the previous chapter when Jesus had this interaction with Nicodemus in the middle of the night. Nicodemus had some misunderstandings about who Jesus was, and he came to Jesus with some sincere questions. And we said last week that when we have sincere questions, God is always uh, faithful to answer those questions, regardless of how uh, ridiculous our questions are. If, they're, if they have a sincere heart behind them, then Jesus meets us, even if in the middle of the night. So today, just one chapter over here in John chapter 4, Jesus has left Jerusalem uh, where he was to celebrate the feast. And uh, right away, after a, a day's journey in the very, very, very hot Palestine sun, he has this encounter with this woman. Now, the woman, you may say, I, you know, Pastor Steve, I have nothing, no connection with this woman at all. I don't see how I can step into the Bible and find myself there. I would say, you know, be careful uh, to, to too quickly say that you have nothing in common with this woman. You may not be uh, from Samaria. You may not be uh, of her, uh, you know, of her ethnic background. You may not worship Baals. But let's face it, pretty much everyone in the room can identify with the kind of misunderstandings that she has about the Lord. Today, if you're not off on some tangent or down in some ditch, you probably just got out of one or will be in one again soon. And so this woman, though we, maybe in the physical sense, it's hard for us to find a connection with her. In the spiritual sense, all of us have been there at one time or another. Now the interesting thing about the story for me is, and you can see it even in the, the title of the sermon, is that, that Jesus knows perfectly what's going on in our hearts. Just back there in John chapter 3, that we saw two different places where the Bible said that Jesus didn't need us to testify to him about what was in our heart because he already saw it perfectly. Today, regardless of who you are, where you come from, what you had for breakfast this morning, what skeletons are in your closet, Jesus knows perfectly what's in your heart. He sees into our heart with perfect clarity. Well, that's a humbling thought, isn't it, Brother Don? To know that regardless of what's going on in your mind or in your heart today, God knows. And to the good and to the bad. We may put on a facade that fools those around us. You may fool the preacher. You may fool your spouse, children, young people. You may fool your parents, but none of us fool the Lord. That's just a remarkable thing. So this morning, I want to point out for you a, a short list of things that Jesus knows about this woman. Now, as we just observe some things from the text, and we recognize the things that Jesus knows about this woman without her ever really telling him, I want you to weigh your own heart and see if maybe some of these same attitudes or these same mantras might be playing out in your own life. And I think as we do, and we're honest with ourselves, we'll realize that we are the Samaritan woman in so, so many ways. So let's make a list of the things that Jesus knows about her. Number one, and these will not be on the screen, I'd encourage you, if you're so inclined, to make a list of them, at least, at least mentally, but prayerfully, maybe you'll write them down as well. So here are some things that Jesus knows about this woman, and they're powerful. Number one is Jesus knows that she doesn't recognize him. When they have this encounter, right off the bat, as Jesus begins to have dialogue with her, it becomes apparent that though she has some religious background, she has some religious understanding, 
No, no, let me say that to have religious understanding in the day that we live in and the day that she lived in does not mean that you have truth. In this case, there's a difference between understanding and truth. You can have a, a, a system of thought that you understand, but it does not mean that that system of thought is legitimate. As I mentioned earlier, this woman come from 500 years of people that had commingled the, the teaching of the Old Testament about who God is and the false teaching of Baal, and they merged them together. Well, you might say, well, Pastor Steve, we would never do that. We would never worship a Baal. And I agree, there's probably no one in here that has worshipped a Baal. But I guarantee there's a lot of people in here that have worshipped themselves. There's a lot of people in here that have worshipped uh, the, the, the love of the flesh. There are people in here that ha have worshipped their vocation, that have worshipped their home, that have worshipped the, uh, the gadgets that you have, that have worshipped pornography. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Maybe I've not named yours yet, but I could. But I could. So if we're being honest with ourselves, all of us, because of our fallen nature, we have a propensity to mingle our religions. What the Bible says and what the self says. We bring them together. At least this woman was pretty straightforward about it. She has this interaction with Jesus, and as they begin to dialogue, it becomes apparent that she has no idea who Jesus is. When Jesus says, give me a drink, she sees the physical differences. She, has, she understands that Jesus is a man. She understands that Jesus is a Jew and that customarily a Jewish man would have not have had a private conversation with a Samaritan woman. She sees that. But when Jesus says, give me a drink, and she recognizes the rather unorthodox nature of their conversation, Jesus doesn't stop there. She says, well, who are you? You're not, you're not better than Jacob, our patriarch of the faith, who gave us this well. And Jesus said, I'm even better than that. If you knew who I was, I would not be asking you for a drink. You would be asking me for a drink. And the water that I would give you would spring up in you into eternal life. She recognizes, Jesus recognizes that he, she doesn't know who he is. Now, let me just kind of put some skin on this and make it a little more accessible for us. In the day that we live in, especially in the church setting, when we come across people that may be of a lower maturity spiritually, or we, we encounter folks, whether it's within the church or outside of the church, that have less understanding about spiritual things than we do, oftentimes our inclination is to reject them, to write them off, to uh, push back or to resist them, to, to look down on them or to set them aside. You see, Jesus doesn't do that. That's remarkable to me. Jesus is sitting there, and the Bible even says that he was wearied from travel, and it really shows us how Jesus was fully human, that he knew what it was like to be thirsty. He knew what it was like to be out in the Palestine sun on a long walk. Now, the text doesn't really reveal it clearly, but in these, at this time of day, in that part of the world, in this time of season, it would have been unbearably hot. Now, I, I was telling the, the 8 o'clock crowd that uh, Andrea and I, we have some family in southern Arizona, and so we, we travel there every now and then. We usually fly into Phoenix and drive down to Tucson, spend time with family. And if you've ever been out there in about July, you, you'll know that it is insanely hot. I, I'm still trying to figure out how in the world anybody ever settled there. Why did everybody? I, so at some point, people were going west, and they ended up in southern Arizona, and there's nothing but dirt and like tumbleweed, and it's just insanely hot. And somebody said, you know, I think I'm going to build a house here. Let's just stay here forever. I mean, that's a great idea. It blows my mind. 
every time we go to Arizona, I, I always bellyache the whole time we're there about just how stupid hot it is. I mean, it, you know, take your breath away hot. And I sweat like a pig anyway. And so I, you know, I bellyache about the heat and, and they always say the same thing. They always say, and you've heard it. They say, yeah, but it's a dry heat. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. You know, my oven makes dry heat. I don't get inside of it. You know, you should go to Indiana where it's nice and warm and never rains or snows. You tell me who the fool is here, right? So, so it's hot, and Jesus has been walking, the, and the Bible doesn't shy away from Jesus' humanity, but rather God the Father wants us to see at this point, Jesus is fully human. Fully human in, in, all, in all the ways that we are. He was thirsty. He, he was tired from walking in the heat. And, and he, doesn't, he doesn't resist this, but rather he, he's transparent about his humanity with this woman. Now, now, we have to be really careful and not take that too far because, yes, Jesus was fully human in every single way, but the Bible also teaches us that he never, ever, ever, ever sinned. That he was tempted in all the ways that we are, but never sinned. That there was no stain or blemish in him. So sometimes, you know, we can build a false religion even by saying, well, you know, Jesus was God, but when he was here on earth, he, you know, he knew a lot of things, but he wasn't perfect. That is a false religion. You may have understanding, but your understanding is corrupted. But there's a whole school of thought out there in the day that we live in. There's, I mean, there's churches all over the place that whether they realize it or not, they have ascribed to that kind of thinking that, you know, that Jesus' power made his climax in the Bible, but today he's no longer as powerful or as perfect or as consecrated as he was in the Father's economy during biblical times. So we have to be really careful or we can almost instantly become the Samaritan woman. So Jesus and, and she have this encounter, and he's thirsty, and he's alone, and he's sitting there. And the woman walks up, and she begins to draw water. And as they begin to talk, it becomes apparent that she doesn't know who Jesus is. But you know, Jesus does not cast her out. Jesus does not set her aside. Jesus doesn't even scold her. He doesn't deny that she has a misunderstanding, but rather he engages her misunderstanding. See, many times, even as churchy people, when we encounter people that are, uh, yeah, you like that, don't you? Are of less maturity, that have less understanding, maybe don't have the spiritual giftedness that we do, our inclination is to turn away. Now, you, you don't see it in the text, but I want you to allow your mind to take a little journey within the framework of the Bible here. So Jesus is sitting here, the woman is drawing water, and when she begins to talk in inaccuracy about who Jesus is, Jesus doesn't turn away from her as is our inclination oftentimes. But rather, I envision Jesus standing to engage her. She doesn't recognize Jesus. She has a flawed doctrine. She does not have spiritual discernment, like maybe some of you, that Jesus doesn't write her off. Jesus doesn't write her off. I want you to see that so oftentimes, regardless of whether it's a family situation, a church situation, it, it's something in a personal relationship, so oftentimes when someone exhibits a character trait that we don't approve of, or, or maybe it's not as mature as we would desire, we'll put that person at arm's length. We'll think less of them. We, we, we will entertain them face to face, but maybe when we're away from them, our words and our thoughts about them are less than stellar. But Jesus, here in the story, this woman is not as mature as she could be or should be, but Jesus does not walk her off. Jesus doesn't abruptly end the conversation. Jesus doesn't just poo-poo her away because of her lack of understanding. 
but rather he engages her. So number one, she doesn't recognize Jesus, and he sees that, yet he does not push her out. Number two, she has a false religion. If you look at verses 20 through 24, here's what the Bible says. It says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem, the place where men ought to worship, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth in truth. When Jesus has this interaction with this woman at the little town of Sychar, the mountain that she's referring to is Mount Gerizim. And it was on top of Mount Gerizim where the people of Samaria would go and worship the Baals of Assyria. And so they have this interaction, and she clearly shows that she has a flawed understanding of religion in general, that she has corrupted the very basics of the faith. Now, an interesting thing is, as we've already established, Jesus Jesus doesn't cast her out. Jesus doesn't cut her off. Jesus engages her, even in light of her false religion. Now, that that really touches my soul when I read that, because I realize that even in my own heart, there's a tendency that when people disagree with my religion, to just cut them off. I mean, whether it's, um, you, you, can, you see this, there's an entire spectrum that this is true. I mean, one thing, look at the, look at the way that we have such a, a tendency to write off people that have sexual perversion. No, sexual perversion is an abomination. I mean, it's horrible. It corrupts our heart. It separates us from God. It breaks relationships. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we just overlook this. But what I am suggesting is, is even, even within the confines of the church that we have these um, sort of pet sins that we're clearly okay with. That, that we, you know, we've just allowed these things to become part of who we are and, and we no longer see the standards that the Bible presents. And we just say, well, you know, this is, this, you know, it's just a sign of the times that we live in. And we just, we accept these things. And then other things we are so phobic of that we won't even allow people to come in the back door of the sanctuary if they practice these things. You know, I'm confronted over and over and over again. You know, whether it's in something I read or a conversation I have with a church member or someone that's a member of another church, and I'm just reminded that that there are certain sins. We've built this system that that, that says, you know, certain sins are, are not only uh, not only not a, a, an abomination, but we, you know we're almost inclined towards them. And then there are other sins, man. We we just we're phobic. Of. We don't have anything to do with people that practice these certain sins. And you know, one of those certain sins is false religion. I mean, look, look just look at the the kind of the climate that's going on in our world today. People that have um, I'm sweating like a pig up here. People that have uh, misunderstandings about who God is, they they need to be educated. They need to be engaged. They need need to be helped. They need to be corrected. They don't need to be cast out. And people people that have major sin problems, addictions, perversions, they don't need to be thrown in the dumpster. They need to be lifted out of the ditch. They They need to be confronted. Like Jesus confronts this woman, He does not overlook her sin, but he doesn't throw her away like a piece of garbage either. He loves her, and he gives her truth. He gives her truth in love. Now, it's high time that the people of God understand that God has not left us here to throw people in the garbage, but to proclaim Jesus Christ and him crucified that he loves people, that he pursues people, people that don't recognize him, people that have false religion, people that that have messed up perspectives. Jesus is pursuing them. You may not be comfortable with that. In fact, that may really anger you, but it's true. It's God's way. And the truth of it is, who in here has anything that you did not receive? I mean, there's not a person in the room that bootstrapped themselves up to heaven. 
None of us. And so if you're going to, if you're going to pick up a handful of rocks, brother or sister, be very careful. Be very careful. Jesus had 10,000 times as many reasons as any of us to stone this woman, but he didn't. He, did. he corrects her, but he loves her. Remember the testimony of the Scripture is that the Father desires that none perish, but all come to repentance. If that's true, and it is, and the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How can people that are in a dumpster, how are people that we have totally isolated ourselves from, how are people that are different than us but have been separated out away from the church, how will they ever hear if we cut them off, if we separate, how will they ever hear the good news? Jesus understands this. So rather than giving her body language that says she's not worthy that you know that she doesn't stand a chance, that you know that she's an adulterer and a fornicator and, and nobody cares about her. Jesus continues to engage her in spite of her lack of spiritual discernment and even in spite of her false religion. Now, with that said, think about the different places that this comes into play. Think about the way the church engages homosexuality. I'm not even going to preach on that because I don't need to. Think about the way the church of the Lord Jesus interfaces with Muslim America. I'm not asking you to adapt Islam. I'm not asking you to accept it. Absolutely not. But we can't throw those people in the garbage. Can't. Totally disagree with their religion. I have absolutely no tolerance for Islam and the teachings of it. Those people need Jesus, and they need him really bad. The truth of it is, it's not been all that long ago that I was just as cut off from God as they were. You know, it, it, it was not pornography. It was not homosexuality. It was not Islam. But I had a false religion because I loved myself. I loved myself in an unhealthy way. I love myself above the Lord. I love my flesh and I fed it. Now I'm guessing, I'm guessing most of you would have to say the same. How many people have we thrown away? How many people do we have to throw away before we learn the lesson? It just amazes me how so often, even within the body of Christ, when we have someone fail, first thing we do is write them off, throw them away, kick them out. It's wrong. Jesus sees all these things about her, and he loves her in spite of her failings. She doesn't recognize him. She has a false religion. Number three, she had broken God's law. She had broken God's law. Look at verses 16 through 18. The Bible says, speaking of Jesus, says, He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. And in verse 19, there's something that happens that I still laugh about. I love reading verse 19, and it causes me to actually laugh because it's so emblematic of how God can see down into our hearts with such perfect clarity. I'm talking laser point precision that Jesus is looking down into your heart right now. He knows every single thing that's there. And we deny it. We, we try to cover it up. We act like it's not there. And this woman, she's a representative of the preacher and of each one of us today. Look, look what Jesus just says. He, he says, you know, I, I've never even met you before. And I know you don't have a husband, but you've already had five of them. And the man that you're with right now is not your husband. Now, what he could have said is you're a whore. But he didn't say that. He didn't say that. He just gave her truth. And then here, look at what she says in response in verse 19. It's amazing. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, if I wrote a Bible, I would put in parentheses there, duh. I mean, it's, it's comical. 
Jesus looks right down into her dirtiest parts, into the embarrassing stuff that no one's supposed to see or know about. The stuff that she had hidden away in the closet, safe and secure from all alarms. No one's ever going to dig this dirt up on me. Boom, she meets Jesus, and he looks right down into the heart of the matter. Mind-blowing sight into her heart. And her response is, dude, I think you might be a prophet. I mean, it cracks me up, but it reminds me so much of myself. I'll be honest with you, uh, when, when Ben, totally unscripted this morning, we were in worship time, and uh, Ben invited you to come to the altar. He did not clear that with the preacher. You see, he did not have my permission to say that. But I'm going to be honest with you. I stood here, and I was under tremendous compulsion to bow at the altar and worship Jesus in private. And I fought it. I fought it. felt peer pressure. I felt your eyes on the back of my head. I resisted it. And the whole time, God's looking down into my heart, and he knows exactly what's there. Why do we fight that? Why do we fight that? She did. I did. Probably some of you did. He sees down into our hearts, and the most we can say is, I, I think you might be a prophet. What we should say, I think you're the one that flung stars into the sky. I think that every single... Every single atom, every fiber, every tissue in my body, you knit together in my mother's womb. That you hold the days of my life in your hand. And one day, I'm going to stand before you. And when I do, if I try offering a defense, I will melt before you like a wax figurine in front of a blowtorch. That's who I think you are. She doesn't recognize Jesus. She has a false religion. She's broken God's law by committing adultery and fornication. Jesus still hasn't written her off. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If it was my gospel, I would have. I would have written her off. I'm betting you would have too. I mean, who can save this woman? I mean, look at all. She is a lost cause. She's a basket case. I mean, maybe one of these things, she could be redeemed from that. But no way, not not two things or three things or four things. No way. Don't even waste your time on her, brother or sister. Don't even waste the good news on her casting your pearls before swine. Jesus does. He continues to give her good news. If you only knew who you was talking to, you would ask me for water and I'd give it to you. And it would cause your soul to never thirst again. Number four, Jesus knows that this woman is a scorned woman. The Bible really doesn't make a big deal about it, but it just mentions that this woman went to get water in the very hottest part of the day. She's there at noon, six hours after the sunrise, hottest part of the day. It would have been virtually unbearable. Everybody else in town has figured this out, so they go get their water at daybreak when it's nice and cool. But because she's a scorned woman, because she wears this scarlet letter, she does not want the rebuke and the backbitings and the the murmurings of the town people. They'd cut her off like a good Baptist would. They had denied her. Now, rather than talking to her, they talk about her. Rather than looking her in the face, they talk behind her back. She knows it. She is a scorned woman. I know this morning, because I am one, I know that I'm speaking to a whole group of people that know exactly how that feels. You've been scorned. You've done things in your past that you're hideously ashamed of. People know it. Maybe, Maybe they don't talk about it to your face, but you at least suspect that they do behind your back. You're ashamed and you feel the weight of your guilt every single day. And that's this woman. And I just want to assure you, that though the Bible doesn't really bear it out, when they're talking, when they're engaging one another, and Jesus is giving her water from the well of life, he sees her scorn. He sees her brokenness. He, he, He feels the weight of her burden. 
He sympathizes and empathizes with her. He loves her. He wants to redeem her. He wants to give her life. He doesn't want her to be an adulterer or a fornicator. So he continues to go back, to go back, to go back to her, giving her good news, good news, wrapping it in different paper, delivering it from a different angle. But it is absolutely important to the Savior that this woman hear the good news in such a way that she can grab a hold of it and drink from the cup. It's absolutely imperative to him. Now we come to a bit of a theological impasse because on the one hand, we, we might be inclined, if we're Jesus here at the well with this, with this fallen woman, we, we might be tempted to say, well, you know, you're real close. You're real close. You, you know, you've heard some good news, and you're, it seems like something's going on in your heart. And, and, and though you're a fornicator and an adulterer, it's you know we really want to baptize somebody this month and so so we'll just we'll overlook the unrighteousness we'll 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 sacrifice or compromise truth to get you in so you can drink of the water but remember last week we saw that Jesus will not do that that his truth is greater than our comfort it's greater than our preferences. It's greater than our desires. It's greater than us. I want, I want you to know that God sent forth the Son to seek and to save sinners, but He will not overlook His righteousness. So sometimes we're tempted to make it easier to get people in to sacrifice truth, to round up. But Jesus won't. He loves her. He sympathizes with her. He wants her to drink of the water. But there are just certain things that he will not compromise on. He keeps going back to her and he keeps going back to her. He's showing grace and mercy and mercy and grace over and over and over and over. You see, the text also says, that there is a day coming where we'll have to worship the Lord in both spirit and truth. Now we live in a day where everybody wants to worship the Lord in spirit. Where, you know, if it feels good here, we're good. You know, if it makes us happy, it must be from God. If it pleases our own flesh, he who dies with the most toys wins. Jesus says here that the true worshipers of God worship Him both in spirit, with their life, and in truth. And the truth of it is, is there's only one name given to men under heaven by which we must be saved. The truth is exactly what Jesus had already told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You must, you must be born again. No compromise. No let up. No sacrifice, no rounding up, no substandards. You must be born again. Jesus says, I have the water and you have the thirst. You may be tempted to drink of another well, but that won't quench. You will drink of the water of another well and you will continue to thirst and thirst. And thirst. It's like a man who's, who's been shipwrecked and he's out on a desert island. He has no access to fresh water. You know, his inclination is to drink the salt water. But the salt water just makes the thirst greater. It doesn't really quench. And Jesus says, I have the water of life. But I cannot, I cannot compromise the truth. And so all of us are here. And at one time or another, we've been asking God to compromise on truth. And over and over and over again, He refuses to will not compromise truth. He loves you, but He will not compromise truth. So He sent truth to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became life. And the life was the light of men. I'm no Samaritan woman, but I want you to know the full weight of this is on my heart right now. 
full weight of it. What do any of us have that we were not given? All we like sheep have gone astray. You know, I think about my children. You know, what's a sermon without using your kids as an illustration? But I think about my children. How far would they have to fall before I would deny them? I don't know. I can't even conceive of it. How, how great the depravity must be before my children would no longer be the recipient of my love. And that's exactly what's happening here. This Samaritan woman has fallen and fallen and fallen and fallen. And yet she is not outside of the reach of the Father. So much so that if she were the only woman on earth, the son would have still been at Sychar's well that morning to give her living water. It was enough. And so the thing that we have to see that we can't, we just can't leave here until we've wrestled with this is in light of all her failings and the fact that we would have written her off long ago that Jesus doesn't. And so as great as Jesus' knowledge and insight down into her life is, all of those things are within the umbrella of His forgiveness. When you go back to the text, you see a stirring begin to happen. And if you read Jesus' words beginning at verse 21, He, he, makes, this, he makes this final plea with her. He, he, he proclaims her false religion. He says, you, you know, there's a day coming when everyone will have to decide whether or not they're going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And it doesn't exactly say, but we're inclined to believe that something happened in this woman's heart. In verse 25, the Bible says, The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. That is He who is called Christ. When that one comes, He will declare all things to us. Have you ever... Have you ever had a time where, where you were really impassioned? I mean, you were really wound up about something, and, and, and you were trying to make a point, and you realized that just as you spoke a particular word, that it was almost a self-fulfilled prophecy. That even as the words come out of your mouth, you realize that you were right in the center of that situation. That's what's happening here with this woman. She starts to talking about the coming Messiah, how the one will come. And I believe that right at this moment, as the words are coming out of her mouth, she realizes that Jesus is in front of her. Almost like the disciples on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection of Jesus. Though that very first Sunday, they're walking along and they're talking with Jesus who is in the resurrected form. These two guys are and they don't realize who Jesus is and, and, and they get to their house and the Bible says that Jesus acts as if he would go farther and, but they don't want him to leave. They don't know who he is but their hearts have been so warmed they don't want him to leave so they invite him in. And the Bible says that they sit down to break bread together and just as they break bread, they realize their hearts are open to who Jesus is, and he vanishes. It's the same thing here. Just as she speaks the words about the coming Messiah, she realizes that he's in front of her. And the Bible continues. Verse 26 says, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. <sighs> And then there's a diversion. And I'm not going to tell you that verse 27 is there because Satan was somehow interacting in this. But it, it seems almost without fail that any time God is doing an amazing work, Satan always tries to send a distraction. There's some disruption. That there's some coolness that comes into the room. And 27 says that the disciples came and they were amazed. Wow. Obviously, we're Southern Baptists. Jesus, why would you talk to this adulterer? Did do you know who she is? Why are you wasting your breath on her, Rabbi? And Jesus doesn't take the bait because he knows. Verse 28. So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, you see that? The woman 
heard the good news, she went into the city and said to the men, that may irk you, but there it is. Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. You know, I, I like the way the King James Version says that in verse 29 because basically it's, it just changes the words up. And it says, come, see a man who told me all the things that ever I did. I mean, can we really deny that Jesus knows all the things that ever you did? He knows your comings and your goings. He knows the condition of your heart. He knows what you're thinking even now. He does. And the truth of it is, is some of you can't wait to get out of here. And he knows that. And some of you are just dying to get to this altar. And you're just wishing I would shut up so you could. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that in a moment. The messed up woman, and Jesus has not thrown her away. Her heart is now stirring and the only thing that she knows to do is to go and talk to the authority figures in her life, the men of the town of Sychar, and says, you need to come out and meet this guy. I think he's the one. I think he's the one. He just gave me living water. I was thirsty, and now I've been quenched. I was lost, and now I'm found. I don't even understand it all. My, my theology is not yet complete, and yet I know that something has happened. There was a day, uh, a number of years ago, we, we were in a, a revival meeting in a, a slum in Nairobi, Kenya. And, and, you know, a church there is nothing like a church here. I mean, it's just otherworldly from this. It, it, it's, it's a couple of sticks stuck in the ground with a corrugated piece of tin as a roof. And, and, and everybody in town comes out. It's not like Fort Wayne, Indiana, you know, where maybe one out of 20 people actually get up and go to the house of God on Sunday morning. Everybody gets up and comes. And, and this little Kenyan pastor, about that tall, I mean, just preaches heaven down. I mean, pulled out all the stops, just preached Jesus and him crucified. And then during the invitation, there's, there's music playing. And he says, glory, glory, glory. Somebody touched me, and I think it was the Lord. He was so touched to the Holy Spirit that he was convinced that he had actually been touched by Jesus himself. And I want to tell you, that's the same kind of enthusiasm this woman went into Sychar with. I can't explain it. I don't understand all the parts of it. I don't know how it works, but I know that I have been given living water. My life has been changed. And she can't wait to tell somebody about it. And Sychar is never really much mentioned again in the Bible. It's not recorded that Jesus ever went back there for a second meeting. But I just can't help but wonder if this woman, in her encounter with Jesus, didn't start a whole new thing. People were no longer going up Mount Gerizim and worshiping the bales up there. Now maybe they threw some sawdust down on the ground and started a little tent meeting right there at Sychar. And boys and girls and their husbands, the women's husbands, and uh, all, all the town people, they came and they received the living water. They were no longer so inclined towards Jacob's well, but the water that Jesus had. Man. there. I think I've just met the one. I mean, I was lost and now I'm found. I was thirsty and now I've drank of His water and my soul is satisfied. I've met the Messiah, the Christ of God. So this morning, there's somebody here that's never heard the good news in this way before. And you, today, you need to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Because Jesus said there's a day coming when all of us would stand before the Lord. Now, I don't know when it'll be for you, but it's coming. It is coming. It is coming. It could happen today. It could happen 50 years from now, but it is going to happen. And so you need to do that today. You need to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved today, right now. And there are others of you that have been walking with Jesus for a long time, but you've fallen in a ditch. 
you got off on a false religion. You became a Pharisee. You started developing a, a, a false religion of nothing but rules and laws. And you have a religion of moral improvement. Your heart has grown cold. Jesus doesn't warm your heart anymore. When you hear about the woman at Sychar's well, there's just nothing going on. Today, you need to allow Jesus to pull you up back onto the path where your first love was. Don't waste another day on the false religion of yourself. Regardless, every, everyone in this room is being spoken to by the Lord. He's going back, he's going back, he's going back, and he's going back, re-engaging your heart from a million different angles until you believe. May you believe. Father, thank you for truth, bone-crushing truth. But Lord, thank you also for tremendous grace that, that my limited tongue cannot even scratch the surface of describing. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit somehow has gotten through to these hearts what I've been trying to say all along but couldn't. Lord, we know in our heart of hearts that sin abounds. But that grace abounds all the more. At 1 John chapter 1, says that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, for all these adulterers and fornicators and thieves and gossips and slanders, for all these people that love themselves and have set up a thousand false idols, Lord, I pray that love would abound. I pray that grace would abound.